Okay, um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening from where you're joining us from. Welcome to today's um, um, uh, uh, Welcome to today's Financing Locally Led Adaptation Actions a Session, all led by CARE, CARE International in collaboration with um, ADA, Luxembourg and um, Civil Society Network uh, in Malawi. I would like us to kindly mute ourselves if uh, we are not speaking and, and also use the chat box to ask any questions or comments. Also, please uh, introduce yourselves in the chat as we proceed with the session. Um, my name is Malina Choki. I will be the facilitator for today's session. I work with the Care International as the Global Policy Leads, uh, Climate Justice, and I'm based uh, in Nairobi. So today we have um, six panelists who will share with us um, different experiences from different uh, regions on how uh, financing locally led um, adaptation uh, experiences is is being viewed in different in different countries. Uh, before we start, I would like to quickly introduce our panelists. And I will share my slides. So he, these are our speakers for today. We have Eva Schroeder from Policy, uh, Policy Coordinator, Climate Change Minister of Foreign Affairs in Netherlands. We also have Julius Ngoma, the National Coordinator at CISONEC, Civil Society Network on Climate Change from Malawi. We are also joined by Willie Misak, a Founder and Executive Director, Land to Serve from Vanuatu. We have Dr. Bimal Raj, who's the team leader, UK AIDS our Policy and Institutions Facility. We are also privileged to have uh, Mathilde Baum, uh, joining us, who's the head of knowledge management from Ada Luxembourg and um, Peter Copper, senior policy officer on climate ministry of uh, foreign affairs. I would like to um, invite Inge, Climate Justice Center director to welcome us to this today's session before we continue uh, with the with the session in terms of the next uh, activity. Welcome, Inge. Thank you very much, Marlene. And good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all of you, depending on where you are. I'm really honored to welcome you all to today's uh, CBA 16 session led by CARE and key partners, as Marlene just told you, about the important topic of financing locally led adaptation actions. It's great to see so many of you joining today from all parts of the world, and it's great that you're starting to introduce yourselves through the chat function. Uh, as you know, this year, CBA's focus is on the principles for locally led adaptation, and the CBA ensures that we as an adaptation community can come together to share knowledge and expertise on how to put the locally led adaptation principles into practice while recognizing the complexities and challenges that we must overcome and the innovations that we must develop. Today's session will provide the space to drive our joint ambition for a climate resilient future by looking more closely at financing locally led adaptation actions. The principles for locally led adaptation are intended to guide the adaptation community as it moves programs, funding and practices towards adaptation that is increasingly owned by local partners at grassroots levels. Uh, at CARE, CARE International, we believe that there is a need to shift from top-down approaches to new models where local actors have greater power and resources to build resilience and adapt to climate change. And that is why we as CARE and as one of many organizations actually have signed on to the principles for locally led adaptation. Finance for climate adaptation is still inadequate, unfortunately, and it's not sufficiently reaching the poorest, most vulnerable and most marginalized communities. There are efforts in place to enhance this, but we are not there yet. The IPCC has highlighted that current adaptation measures are insufficient, the progress is uneven and that the world is not adapting fast enough. 
Even more concerning is that only 4 to 8 percent of all climate finance has been allocated to adaptation action. And it is estimated that less than 10 percent of mitigation and adaptation finance from global climate funds is focused at the global at the local level. And that means uh, two things. First, there is an urgent need to scale up the provision of climate finance for adaptation with predictable funding and big steps must be made, as we all know. Secondly, there is an urgent need to make this funding more accessible to local actors. Multilateral funds, such as the Green Climate Fund, but also those actors who can access finance from these multilateral funds have an important role and duty to play in making finance accessible to local actors. They should actively embrace approaches such as on-granting to in-country stakeholders to allow communities and other local stakeholders to access money for effective adaptation. That would prevent them from having to go through very long, uh, complex and bureaucratic international procedures. At CARE, we believe that financing locally led adaptation actions will empower communities to lead sustainable and effective adaptation to climate change at the local level. And I'm looking forward to hear from the distinguished speakers today how they look at this. And therefore, I will no longer hold you up, but I wish you all a very inspiring webinar, which is hopefully helpful in your daily work. Thank you for joining and enjoy the discussions. Back over to you, Marlene. Marlene, we cannot hear you. You are on mute. <laughs> yeah, I was unmuting myself. So thank you so much, uh, Inge, for setting the scene and reminding us about um, the, the theme for CBA 16 this year and also the, uh, the session, what it's all about in terms of uh, financing locally led adaptation actions. I would like to, we, we are going to hear from the different uh, panelists on what are the different experiences from different regions. Uh, basically, what are the barriers? What are the challenges? Uh, what's not working? What's working? And what can we do to make it better? And uh, uh, from the eight uh, principles for, from, for locally led adaptation, we know that uh, climate uh, finance is one of the principles, the third principle um, in particular, uh, which really looks into ensuring that the community and the grassroots um, uh, communities at the grassroots level are at the center of decision making on uh, different adaptation um, actions, but also of importance uh, to have them making decisions on how um, to implement the programs, but also um, we have a role to provide and uh, funding that is um, easily accessible, funding that is um, long enough to, for, for communities to be able to see transformative actions, but also funding that um, is not um, in terms of uh, loans that would, would keep communities um, build their burden to, to, to addressing the impacts of climate change. Um, so before we start um, with our listening to our, our speakers for today, I would like us to uh, do a small exercise on Mentimeter. And my colleague uh, Aya will lead us on this. So uh, we have two questions on Mentimeter that we would like to engage the, the participants on before we start engaging with our panelists. Um, and the first question is, um, what are the biggest barriers to financing climate action at the local level? What are the biggest barriers to financing climate action at the level, local level? And um, the second question uh, that we will uh, tackle on Mentimeter is, um, how can financial institutions support transformative local adaptation actions? Uh, Aya is going to share with us the links on chat. I'm also going to press the questions again, but they're also on Mentimeter for us to, to do this. We have 10 minutes to um, engage on this session before we start uh, engaging with our panelists and hearing the, 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 the vast experience that they're going to share with us today. So uh, let us all head to the Mentimeter. Aya, do we have that on board? Yes, can you see my screen? You can access this Mentimeter in two ways. You can go to the link that I put in the chat, or you can go to menti.com and key in the code here, um, written on top of the board. It's 89133700. Thank you. Uh, we have um, 
nine minutes about for the session now. So kindly um, let us put our, our comments and ideas uh, to quick start our session for today on here and the Mentimeter. Thank you. Don't forget to answer the second question. So once you submit your answer to the first one, uh, you will be directed to the second question. And this is how the second board looks like. There's some answers already. Yeah, I'm seeing a number of um, feedback coming in for the first question. Uh, what are the key barriers? Um, we have lack of proper targeting of uh, adaptation interventions. Um, bureaucracy and the wrong idea of accountability is uh, one of the challenges that uh, we have actually identified here uh, to accessing our climate finance at the local level. Um, understanding how long to fund and at what level, how do we ensure that local actors are appropriately engaged and co-led? Uh, lack of evidence uh, is a key barrier here. There's still not enough overall funding for adaptation to allow multiple initiatives in multiple countries to get to scale. Uh, good initiatives have to compete with each other. Very key. Uh, there's, uh, I think, uh, lack of commitment here also as one of the barriers. There's disconnect between requirements for finance provision and local scale needs. Uh, we also have um, a barriers like uh, lack of trust on the local actors, especially grassroots organization. Um, this is interesting. Decisions are being made at national and international level one of the key um, barriers here, and uh, we end up uh, losing the local community's input into decision-making. Um, we have lack of focused budget from central and local governments that are not targeting um, adaptation interventions. Time frames and requirements for completing access forms or systems are uh, also a key barrier here. Uh, we have accountability challenges, uh, corruption is a key barrier on how the finances provided already are being used. Uh, there's lack of planning and scaling experience and, and scaling experience. Uh, definition of adaptation that can accommodate the diversity of actions involved uh, probably is not clear. Uh, most organizations want to engage at the boardrooms and hotels for getting action is at the community level. And this is what we're actually seeing happening. Um, we do have a lot of meetings, yes, in, in boardrooms and hotels planning instead of actually doing this with the communities at the local level where they are. Um, can we see what we have in the second question? Uh, how can we, how can financial institutions support transformative local adaptation actions? Uh, get rid of long bureaucratic procedures. I think uh, that is uh, very key. And we have seen this uh, with the already financial mechanisms that we have. The Green Climate Fund is one of them. And uh, we will hear from one of our panelists on how uh, the experience is on engaging with Green Climate Funds. Uh, uh, we need to have better reporting systems. Uh, we need to reconsider the scale and preferred delivery channels for finance. 
We need to commit to long-term partnerships, at least seven to 10 years and not the normal two to three years uh, that we see, because in that case, we might not be able to see good transformative actions. Low interest, easy access loans and credits uh, should be available to attract um, more community uh, actors to be part of the process. Long time frames for funding, uh, you can't do transformative change in two or three years. Yes, uh, that's correct. Uh, insist on, on policy engagement and code development, monitor and evaluate progress. Yeah, we, we need to evaluate uh, some of the actions and progress that we have for us to improve on um, next programs or um, improve on the challenges that we've had, let's say in the first two, three years of implementation if the project has longer lifespan. Uh, it's very important to understand that transformation involves fundamental changes in systems, especially those that um, impoverish populations and marginalize communities in favor of uh, rapacious corporations and institutional corporation corruption. Uh, it's very important to target local institutions um, to access the, the funding. Um, invest in local actors and particularly women's organizations who have transformative solutions but uh, they are frequently overlooked. Uh, it's very also important, I see here, to channel finance through local government institutions, um, building capacity of local organizations uh, for them to be able to, to do this. And we don't have to always um, fly in our experts. To, to, to do some of the work that uh, local institutions can actually do. Um, do we have any additional? Uh, Long-term and institution building support um, related to just the previous statement. Combine top-down and bottom-up approaches uh, to ensure that these data participatory approaches uh, to work with communities, but also to bring in new information that is needed if it's technology and, and, and all that. Creating small grants between big donors and grassroots organizations to provide adequate capacity for the implementation of local adaptation actions. And finally, um, prioritize local organizations to accreditation and program uh, uh, development. We have seen that um, the accreditation processes for one to be an accredited entity to actually access the uh, climate finance mechanisms that we have, it's actually very robust. And uh, most of the time it locks out local organizations because of the, the fiduciary standards that are set for that. Uh, ensure local government accountability, very important. Uh, we must want to follow up on what's, what's being done and if it's not being done, why is that so? Very important to uh, monitoring is too complex and costly, but I think it's, 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 it's an important aspect for us to always keep planning and improving on our actions. And finally, um, bridge gaps between the financial institutions and local knowledge. These are very, very um, great uh, inputs to start us off with our panelists. on discussing um, this important uh, topic of financing locally led um, actions. I would like to start with um, one of our panelists, um, Bimal from Nepal. Bimal, um, Thank you for joining. And Bimal is the team leader, uh, UK AIDS Policy and Institutions Facility from Nepal. So Bimal, uh, what are the different enablers and barriers in accessing climate finance for local climate change actions? Uh, would you also tell us um, what evidence and experience can you share with us uh, from the Nepal context? Thank you, Marlene. Hello, everyone. So thank you so much for providing me this opportunity to share. It is a very you know, interesting topic, yet very important for least developed countries and communities who are yet rich and vulnerable due to climate change. So it was fascinating to see a lot of responses 
earlier in the discussion about uh, your perception on some of the enablers and barriers. So based on experience of Nepal, uh, let me highlight some of the enablers for accessing climate finance for local climate actions. So one that we really see because Nepal has been uh, piloting, implementing and scaling up local adaptation plans of action uh, as one of the first country to initiate uh, locally led adaptation. So we think that uh, the supportive legal provision is one of the enablers because our climate change policy has uh, the provision of uh, 80%. So any climate finance that comes from international you know, sources has to be, you know, uh, the 80% has to be spent at the local level. So this is a policy provision that is there. So the legal mandate is uh, legally binding for every institutions that uh, you know access or that fund climate change and it has been proved one of the very effective legal provisions similarly with uh, the framework on local adaptation plan of action so nepal has a framework on locally led adaptation so that adheres the federalism and really recognizes the role of local communities and local institutions so that is one the second enablers based on our experience is uh, we, if we have a vibrant institutional mechanism, uh, particularly the community-based organizations are crucial leadership and role uh, that will lead to, you know, effective access of climate finance at the local level and more lobbying from the community-based uh, organization. So Nepal has a history of uh, active community-based organization playing crucial role in natural resource management and addressing local issues. So these vibrant institution mechanism has provided grounds for uh, you know, advocacy and uh, lobbying with the government uh, to really fund uh, local actions uh, that is related to climate change adaptation. The third one based on our experience is the participatory and consultative approaches that are key to you know, enablers for accessing climate finance because uh, it helps to identify local priority and needs uh, give more emphasis to the local vulnerable communities and households. So that is another, you know, enabling um, factor. The fourth one I see is integrating within the government planning and budgeting process. We all know that public finance is no is one of the major, you know, vehicle uh, for uh, funding local climate action. So the whole of government approach. So integrating in the policies, plan, budget and in the fiscal uh, cycle, governance mechanism is very crucial in terms of uh, facilitating the access of climate finance uh, for supporting local action. And the final one, among the most important ones is scaling up good practices, uh, that is resource allocation based on risk and vulnerability. So this is more of targeted approach. So Nepal government has you know, piloted this approach. Uh, so based on the risks and vulnerability of uh, the local governments, they allocate uh, the percentage of financing. So this has proved to be quite effective in terms of targeting uh, the local climate actions. So these are some of the enablers for accessing climate finance for local climate actions, among many that we have uh, discussed earlier, as well as maybe my uh, fellow panelists will highlight more. So can you go to the second slide, please? So on the barriers for accessing climate finance for local climate actions, there are few that I have uh, highlighted here in the slides and I just want to discuss. One is the direct access issues. So we all know that fund is negotiated at the international and national level with the limited role of local actors in these negotiations. So the negotiations are done by the national government. So these direct access issues remain one of the bottlenecks for accessing climate finance to support local climate action. The second one is uh, the train has been uh, towards limited access to grant-based financing as financial institutions, international agencies, priorities towards loan. So now you can see the uh, debate around loan versus grant. So in the past few years, we have seen in different uh, financial uh, instrument or mechanism, whether it is GCF or other mechanism, uh, the priorities on loan and 
there is less priority in grants. That means it is one of the you know bagging barrier for su supporting local climate actions that are mostly you know grant oriented because we are talking about very poor marginalized uh, you know smallholder farmers. The third one I, uh, we have experiences is limited institution capacity at the local level to observe and mobilize climate finance because the institutions are very new, they're evolving, so the capacity less and their experience in fund mobilization is quite limited. So uh, this is one of the barrier uh, that uh, uh, really hinders in accessing climate finance at a larger scale. So the fourth one is local is often misinterpreted as core vulnerables, which is really a core issue, you know, like funding at the local level is often determined and often decided by few elites. And this is social structural issues. Uh, the uh, advantage group uh, priority is reflected. So you can see that even uh, the financial flow at the local climate, supporting local climate actions are invested in infrastructure and general public goods and not really specific to the needs of vulnerable and poor people. The fifth one I see as very important bottlenecks is the equity issues are challenging. Uh, the intersectionality and intergenerational issues, we often don't talk about it. We talk community as a general blanket approach. We talk local as very general blanket approach. And these intersectionality and intergenerational issues, the issues of uh, women, within women, the disabled, the poor, the marginalized youth, uh, people who are in the remote areas, who have very limited access to resources, they are often disadvantaged. So I think one of the challenges for reaching them in terms of their access to climate finance is one of the barriers. And the last one that I really want to highlight is the mismatch of priorities of the local government who really want to invest in local infrastructure. Their priorities are driven by their vote bankers and they are more political motive in nature, similarly with uh, you know, other institutions. So the you know, actual need of really poor and vulnerable action households, mostly investment in building their uh, livelihood asset is often undermined because of this mismatch of priorities. So uh, I just want to end my uh, deliberation here. So thank you so much. So I think this will open more avenues for discussion on what could be you know, enablers and barriers for accessing climate finance. The most important thing is a way forward on how we can ensure climate finance, better access of local communities, in supporting local climate action. I'll be happy to discuss that later on. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, so much, Dr. Bimal. And uh, uh, just to add that Dr. Bimal is a climate resilience and natural resource management expert with more than 21 years of experience uh, in supporting the national and local climate change adaptation priorities in Nepal. And uh, we have seen some similarities from uh, Dr. Bimal's presentation and some of the uh, feedback that we just did in our earlier exercise in terms of um, what are the enablers like supportive uh, legal provisions of climate, like climate change policies, adaptation plans. Uh, we also have um, vibrant uh, institutional mechanisms in Nepal that support um, uh, accessing climate finance at the local level. He's also talked about integrating um, within the government planning and budgeting processes in terms of um, adaptation priorities for communities. And this is very important uh, for the purpose of ensuring that there is budget allocated for uh, local adaptation priorities. Uh, Dr. Bimal has also talked about scaling up good practices um, and resource allocation based on needs, vulnerability, and risks. This is very important to ensure that um, the, the actions are well targeted to really who the, the people who need it the most. He's also highlighted the barriers um, that uh, they face in Nepal in terms of accessing um, local climate finance. Uh, Dr. Bimal has talked about uh, limited access to grant-based financing. And we have seen this uh, causing crisis even to other countries in terms of countries have to, having to deal with um, uh, um, climate debts because they are taking loans to um, build the resilience of their countries and communities. And uh, we are and, and while we are advocating that climate finance for adaptation should be grant based and not loans. Um, another key barrier here is limited institutional capacity. 
uh, to absorb uh, the different impacts. Um, he's talked about the equity issues and also the mismatch of priorities uh, on different uh, sectors. Dr. Bimal, we have a number of questions for you on the chat. Uh, please feel free to look at them. Uh, we will come back to the questions after we have listened to our other speakers. And uh, we will, when we start the question segment, we will start uh, with you. So uh, kindly look through the questions that, um, the, that have been raised. I've seen a number of them on the chat and then we will respond to them afterwards. Our next speaker is uh, Mathilde Baun. She's the head of knowledge management um, at Luxembourg. And Matilda is responsible for the collection, creation and management of knowledge on several topics. Um, uh, this includes social performance, green microfinance, alternative finance for micro and small entrepreneurs. Matilda also works on project evaluation and design and implementation of an impact measurement system within ADA. As an um, a qualified um, auditor, uh, um, Matilda audits and evaluates the social performance management of others uh, partners um, in in implementing micro and small enterprises uh, finance. Matilda, uh, welcome so much to the session and thank you for joining us. We would like to hear your experience from um, Luxembourg. How can climate finance facilitate or support the adoption of adaptation practices for populations? who are vulnerable to the effects of climate change and um, how or why adaptation can be attractive for private finance? How can we make adaptation attractive for uh, private finance at the local level? Matilda, please, um, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you very much, Marlene, and thank you very much for inviting me to take part in this webinar. Uh, maybe if I may, I will start with a very short introduction of ADA, uh, just to set the context and explain why we are able today to talk about uh, um, climate finance and private finance for adaptation. So ADA is an NGO based in Luxembourg. So we are an NGO supporting the development of inclusive finance for almost 30 years now in Sub-Saharan Africa, in Latin America, and in Asia. So what does it mean concretely to support the development of inclusive finance? It means that we have been working mostly with microfinance institutions in our countries of intervention. So at the local level, uh, mostly microfinance institutions, but more and more or also other types of financing institutions, such as fintechs, for instance, or insurance brokers. And we work with them with them to help them. So maybe we can mute. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. Uh, so we work with these financing institutions, local financing institutions, to develop financial products and services adapted to the needs of the population in the field and especially to the needs of vulnerable populations. So as you may know, microfinance for a long time has been uh, expected to reduce especially socioeconomic inequalities uh, in the countries by providing uh, easier access to financial financial services to the people who were excluded from traditional financing systems. But today it has become obvious that these vulnerable populations are also the most affected by climate change. So what does it mean for uh, microfinance institutions then? It means that their clients are among the most affected by the effects of climate change uh, and microfinance institutions uh, support the economic activities uh, managed by these people. So if we take the example um, of smallholder farmers, for instance, microfinance institutions or other local financial institutions support the economic activity of smallholder farmers. And if they are more affected affected by climate change, it means that their production uh, decreases over years or is more at risk uh, over years. It means that they may be less able to produce, may be less able to sell, and then uh, less likely to repay the loans they got from these local financing institutions. So if vulnerable people are more and more affected by climate change, it means that it represents also a financial risk for these local financing institutions for these microfinance institutions. So actually, this is why uh, microfinance institutions or other local financial organizations 
um, should have an interest in supporting the adoption of adaptation practices. This is also a matter of survival for themselves as financing institutions. Otherwise, uh, they will be also at risk themselves. So this is why adaptation can be attractive for local private finance, at least. Uh, however, uh, from our experience, developing such specific financial products uh, is not easy for these local financing institutions. Actually, uh, developing what we call climate smart uh, financial products requires more investments from these microfinance institutions than other uh, usual, let's say, more usual microfinance products. For instance, um, to finance adaptation practices, first, it means that these financial organizations uh, have to promote the adoption of adaptation practices. And usually, it starts with uh, raising awareness among people to make them learn about these adaptation practices. It's also necessary to train people to adopt these adaptation practices. Uh, technical support is needed. And this is not the core business of financial organizations, of uh, microfinance institutions. So some of them with which we work actually do it. So they are involved in awareness raising, they are involved in the promotion of, adap uh, of adaptation uh, practices, but it's not their core business. So it means they need to create partnerships with other civil society organizations, so training centers, uh, associ local associations, local NGOs, uh, which are more experts in adaptation practices, uh, to make sure their clients get the support they need. Financial services are uh, necessary, are useful, uh, either loans or even insurance, but they are not enough actually to facilitate the adoption of adaptation practices. So these partnerships are necessary with other local organizations. And this is where uh, public climate finance may be useful to complement these uh, private local financing mechanisms offered by microfinance institutions, because indeed, some people have, someone has to pay for this technical support provided to facilitate the adoption of these practices. And, uh, and usually, as I said, it's civil society organizations, associations. So these organizations need grants indeed, as uh, it was said just before. So there is a need, uh, one of the enablers, let's say, could be the partnerships between private and public organizations or between profit, uh, for-profit and non-for-profit organizations and especially um, um, the blend what we can call blended finance mechanism right complements private finance with public finance targeting the same kind of population to provide them with a mix of uh, diverse uh, services financial services but also technical and non-financial services um, and I would, I will end now for now, at least saying that this public climate finance is all the more necessary as, as I said, uh, developing um, specific financial products for microfinance institutions targeting uh, climate change issues requires more investments for them. So it also requires to train their staff more than for other products. It also requires to raise awareness among their staff, to train, train them about how to convince people to adopt these adaptation practices. And so it requires more effort. And this is where public climate finance could uh, provide an additional incentive for these local private financial institutions to develop uh, this type of service. Because indeed, one of, the problem, uh, one of the problems we see from our experience is that it is very difficult for these microfinance institutions to scale such uh, climate smart financial products. We support them in the development of these products, in the delivery of these products, but what we see is that usually they have difficulties in scaling them. So this is where they need incentives from elsewhere. And uh, I can stop here for now and develop a bit more on this topic a bit later. Thank you. Thank you so much, Matilda. And, and, and that's very intriguing in terms of how um, the microfinance uh, partners view the uh, impact of climate change and how it's affecting their clients. 
and how this has ripple effect in terms of less able to produce, less able to, uh, less likely to sell, less likely to pay the loans. And also, um, what does it mean for, for the, the, the partners from the microfinance in terms of they need to do more, they need to put in more effort in terms of training, raising awareness to ensure that their clients are actually uh, equipped with uh, necessary information so that when they are uh, provided with uh, resources, they're able to do interventions that will be able to pay back that, the, 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 the resources. And this is very um, interesting uh, discussion, especially on, on the challenges. I really like some of the uh, examples that you have shared. And I've also seen uh, a, a few questions and comments on the chat. Um, kindly have a look at that. And um, we will come back to you in terms of responding to, to the request that we have uh, from, from the participants. Our next um, speaker is Willie Misak, um, Willie Misak from Vanuatu. And uh, uh, Willie Misak uh, is the founder and executive director of Land to Serve Vanuatu. He's also secretariat advisor for Vanuatu Climate Action Network. Uh, Willie is also a Queen Young leader from the Vanuatu and Royal um, Commonwealth Society Associate Fellow. Um, Willie, could you uh, share with us more experience in terms of what are the Vanuatu experiences in accessing climate finance to support adaptation initiatives? Uh, what are the experiences from Vanuatu? What are the challenges? Um, uh, what's working? What's not working? What can you say about Vanuatu in terms of accessing climate finance? Willie, over to you. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, um, um, Marene for um uh, for this uh, invitation and uh, also uh, greetings to, uh, from uh, Vanuatu in the Pacific Ocean um just to give a little bit uh, of uh, the background of uh, Vanuatu Vanuatu is a very tiny little country um uh, in the Pacific Ocean and uh, in all the um, past um report from the uh, world risk report Vanuatu is always uh, you can find it in the uh, in uh, the past world uh, risk report Rank the first um, in uh, as one of the very riskiest country in the world uh, because of two things: one that we are we are located in the chain of fire, and then two, uh, we are in the ring. <clears throat> we are in we are in the middle of the belt of cyclones, so um, very exposed of uh, uh, to uh, different uh, disasters. Um, in terms of um, access to climate financing. Um, Vanuatu uh, civil society organizations and grassroots organizations, we have a lot of challenge uh, to um, access uh, those uh, financing, not only from the grassroots level, but at the national level as well. Uh, for example, the Vanuatu government is not accredited to any of the international um, uh, funds like a green climate funds, adaptation fund. So uh, what we are doing is that we are working through accredited uh, entity like FAO um, and we have uh, the Pacific uh, uh, community and all those regional and international organizations that are accredited allow us Vanuatu and civil society organizations uh, to access those different uh, grants for climate financing and this is a great challenge for small island state like uh, Vanuatu um, and I uh, also acknowledge some of the um, point that uh, my uh, previous uh, colleagues as uh, I mentioned and what of one of the things that uh, we see as enabler in accessing climate financing is finding um, the alternative for uh, or, uh, a middle organization between big uh, accredited entity and a grassroots organization like um, Adil uh, as just mentioned uh, that we're looking at microfinance institutions. And this is one of the things that we in Vanuatu uh, especially grassroots organizations are getting a climate finance through the um, uh, uh, microfinance uh, institutions. And this is what, uh, for our experience, we find it very uh, useful because it bridges the gap between big complex mechanism of understanding how to apply for those and also having that knowledge on what is happening at the grassroots level. And one 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 of the other thing that really makes that those climate financing are very hard to uh, to be to reach 
especially uh, uh, small island states in the Pacific like Vanuatu, is that the, the knowledge about the reality of what is happening on the ground is very blurred at the regional and national international level. So um, the, one of the things is that they can pose the question, why should we give this? Because they have no really good understanding of the reality that is happening in uh, in, 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 the, uh, in the Pacific. And uh, <clears throat> With the Vanuatu Climate Action Network, we came up with one of the strategy and then we find that very meaningful and very effective is to create a very a meaningful collaboration with all the institutions. So we create the Vanuatu Climate Action Network and the Vanuatu Climate Action Network has the NGO, international non-government organization, government institutions, academia, private sector, businesses, and also faith-based organization within that network. And this provides us a strength on accessing all different um, uh, uh, fin uh, uh, funds for climate finance in, in the region. And I think this is one of the very um, unique thing that we see uh, in Vanuatu and also uh, globally, uh, because we have a very, um, a, a very collaborative way to work with our government. We even sit within national institutions to make decisions with our government. And this is not common anywhere in the world. And this provides us with this opportunity that uh, we're looking at the accountability of financing between NGOs and government, and even the government to, to hold NGOs accountability to also provide implementation of the uh, climate finance uh, activities at the uh, local level. And I think uh, as my two colleagues mentioned, lack of understanding of um, the different mechanism at, uh, on accessing climate finance is one of the major things that we see. And it's not only at the grassroots level, but also at the national level as well. And this is where we're looking at capacity building and knowledge uh, about those different funds uh, are, are becoming another barrier for, for us. And knowing the different sources of climate finance, it's the other thing that we, we find it very, um, uh, challenging for us because some of the uh, adaptation, for example, when what do we don't have, we never have access to the adaptation fund, for example. And this is the other thing. And maybe there is other more multiple different uh, fund that out there that we don't even know about it. And I think that this is one of the things that if the grassroots level, we have understanding about that, we can start pushing up and trying to looking at different ways to have access to it. Um, and um, I think to, to I, I will just shorten my, uh, I think most of the thing that my two colleagues have shared really, um, but I think that uh, at the heart of um, the, um, uh, the uh, at the heart of the, the way of accessing climate finance is the true uh, meaningful collaboration between all the organizations within the sectors or within the area where we are working on. And I think this is uh, really to create a powerful tool that we can use to have access to climate financing. And um, uh, or for, 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 for the Pacific region as a whole, uh, I think uh, the review of the climate finance policies must be changed because um, not, on, well, not all the governments in the Pacific have access to those uh, uh, finance. Like even some of the aids are not directed to all the uh, countries. Some uh, some countries in the Pacific ha have access to it, and some not. And this is one of the things that we see uh, as one of the challenges to look at those policies to make it more accessible to everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Willie, and really thank you for the efforts uh, joining us um, this time. Uh, we understand and we acknowledge the that it's, it must be really late at night in Vanuatu, but thank you so much for uh, setting time aside for this. I see a set of questions and comments for you in the chat. Uh, please have a look and we'll come back to you on that. I would like to move to our um, uh, second last speaker, um, who is Julius Ngoma. Um, Julius Ngoma is from Malawi. And, and Julius Ngoma is the coordinator for a civil society network on climate change in, in Malawi. Um, Julius has been leading the network since 2014. 
uh, and he leads the network um, at national level in different platforms and committees. Uh, for example, the National Technical Committee on Climate Change and Disaster Risk Management in Malawi. And he also supports the Working Group on Adaptation in Malawi, co-team for development on the National Adaptation Plan in Malawi, and also the Expert Working Group on Red Plus in Malawi. Julius has also represented um, the network at international level by serving as alternate active observer to the Green Climate Fund uh, process, representing the civil society organizations in the Global South uh, until 2019 uh, for two years. Uh, Julius, welcome so much to this session and thank you for setting the time aside to be with us. We would like to hear from you, um, uh, from your experience uh, sitting at the board of the Green Climate Fund as an alternate observer representing the um, non-state actors uh, from Global South. How do we get climate finance to the local level, particularly for locally led adaptation initiatives? How do we get uh, to, to, to ensure that we have climate finance uh, trickling down, getting down, not even trickling, but getting down to the local level to support adaptation initiatives? Uh, Julius, please. Julius, are you there? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Malin, and thank you all. And thank you for the, for the big question. And um, I hope you can hear me. Yes. Okay, fine. So um, I think I, I had two, uh, two slides. Uh, yeah, Aya is uh, setting that up right now. Yes, so. Yeah, there you go. All right. So for and the Julius, uh, we, you, Julius, sorry, you have five minutes. You're really running out of time. So please no. try to make it short and we have more time for the discussions. Thank you. No, no problem. I think I will not take much of your time because I was listening closely to what my colleagues were also presenting. I think they touched on so many uh, issues that I also wanted to point out. So uh, my duty here is just to maybe emphasize on one or two points. Uh, you had two slides which were uh, actually focusing on two issues, the challenges and opportunities, but also um, uh, talking about what, uh, what are the real experiences and what really needs to happen on the ground to, to, to ensure that the local communities are actually um, benefiting um, from, from, the, uh, from the different resources. So I wanted to just emphasize on one or two points here uh, on the challenges. Uh, one thing uh, my colleague, the previous speaker, has just mentioned about the non-availability of direct access entities, uh, for, for instance, in developing countries. Uh, this is not um, only the case for GCF. Uh, there are so many other uh, funding mechanisms, uh, like, like the Adaptation Fund. You also need to have um, uh, uh, different access modalities. And what is really lacking is uh, countries um, to actually have uh, direct access entities. This, uh, for us, um, it means uh, you are actually connecting the local communities uh, to to actually to the national institutions. So these national institutions can actually play a very big uh, role in terms of ensuring that the resources that are coming either from GCF or from Adaptation Fund or anything, uh, any mechanism at at international level gets down to. To, to the real um, uh, action on the ground, especially on adaptation related interventions. So I think that's one of the key things that is lacking. Uh, we also, um, uh, the, the issue of stakeholder engagement uh, a strategy, uh, that, I mean, to facilitate uh, local CSOs uh, and community involvement. I think that's, that's one thing that has also been mentioned here, but I wanted to emphasize because where there's a disconnect between uh, what um, uh, what we we do at international level, what happens at national level, and what really is happening on the ground. So if uh, the the disconnect that is there is actually making it very difficult for 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 actually for proposals or for projects to actually respond to the actual needs and priorities of the poor and the most vulnerable to the impacts of climate change. So that already. Um, it leaves um, the, the, the implementation of, pro of projects or programs or activities uh, at the very terrestrial level, and that doesn't really go on the ground. And the, finally, I think we need to 
I think one of the colleagues also mentioned about the inadequate involvement of the local councils. These are local district council and the structures on the ground. Um, uh, we might have so many of these uh, in international NGOs, uh, national NGOs, which are actually, uh, when they come on the ground, they will create parallel structures, um, uh, trying to create their own structures of implementation, monitoring and evaluation of, of some of the, the, uh, the activities. But that really leaves out um, um, uh, on the peripherals, the local communities, in terms of uh, them implementing their own activities uh, uh, that they would want, that, that might really um, uh, support their, their initiative. So uh, finally, on the next slide. Next slide, please. Um, okay, so I had uh, six points there, which I'll just quickly mention. And how do we facilitate committees access to, to funds, uh, especially at the, for local, local aid adaptation? Uh, one of the things is about the building capacities of national and even local actors. So the emphasis here should be the, the local community structures. Uh, let's ensure that we, uh, the, the countries actually, those that, for example, my country doesn't really have um, a, a, a complete devolution plan for, for uh, uh, in the different districts. So we need to complete that. We need to make, make sure that we formalize the local structures. We need to make sure that these structures are the ones that are actually being supported to, so that they can be able to implement, uh, even conceptualize, but also implement some of the projects. We need to nature partnerships. Uh, there are so many CSOs on, on, at national level. There are so many local CSOs at, uh, at subnational level that would actually, um, uh, are actually lacking any kind of linkage that is there between uh, the funders and so on. So we need to make sure that these uh, local community structures are also um, you know, linked up with the, some of the, the funders and make, ensure that these are, are able to actually implement uh, together with the other uh, organizations, whether governments, uh, some of the, uh, the, uh, the interventions at local level in terms of adaptation. Uh, the third one is simplifying uh, accreditation processes. I think someone do it on this. Uh, there's so many issues I talked about direct access uh, entities not uh, available, for example, in most of the uh, of the countries, but we need uh, to actually simplify um, uh, more of these processes so that we can reach out to, to those uh, co uh, communities on the ground in terms of implementation of some of the projects. We need special finance, finance windows uh, for different uh, groups. We know, for example, GCF can be very competitive, but I think it doesn't do any harm if we want to to actually advocate for uh, special windows. Jeff has done that. Jeff has done uh, some, some, so it has some, you know, small grants which can actually go to the local communities for them to implement. I think we can do so with the, the GCF adaptation fund and others. We need a robust uh, stakeholder engagement uh, strategy by the unit focal points. Sometimes uh, these uh, the focal points, whether NDA in the in the case of GCF, they would always want to to take things on on their own and then in their own hands without necessarily op opening up to other stakeholders. And uh, uh, finally, um, we also talking talking about robust engagement of local CSOs and local councils. Um, we when we're do, doing the for example the process of developing the the NDC for Malawi, we realize that the the first version of the NDC. I think the, the local councils were, most of the local councils were left out. And then during implementation, they could not even support the, uh, the, 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 the national government. Uh, so that already had a, was a disconnect. And uh, we need to actually ensure that we have a, a, an engagement plan that in, uh, incorporates the CSOs and even local councils for us to actually implement uh, and make sure this financing are actually gained going to the to, to the ground and finally sustainable micro grants i think somebody mentioned about this and um, uh, i i also uh, i think this is also connected to the special fi uh, financing windows i was talking about so we need to actually make sure that we we put this in in place so that those that have uh, we are calling them with little capacity uh, can also be able to to benefit some uh, out of uh, a, a larger grant so that they can be implementing small activities in terms of local aid adaptation. Thank you, Malin. Thank you so much, Julius, uh, for that interesting uh, presentation, especially.
um, nurturing partnerships as, is really coming out as a key uh, point here on how to enhance um, uh, locally led adaptation. So our next speaker is Eva. So we, from the four panelists, we've heard about the different challenges. Ashura is a diplomat and a foreign policy professional with experience in a broad range of topics, um, including um, international justice, human rights, um, migration affairs, and climate change. Eva is currently deputy head of the climate team at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and deputy of head of the Netherlands Net delegation to the UNFT policy negotiations. Uh, within the negotiation, Eva has a special focus on, on climate finance. And Eva will also be joined by um, a colleague uh, who will also uh, uh, add up to more information on uh, some of the interesting discussion that we would we would hear from Eva. And uh, Eva would like to hear fro from you, uh, from your experience uh, leading the Netherlands delegation to the UNFCCC negotiations but also your expertise on climate finance at the negotiation level. Um, how does a Netherlands allocate climate budgets for the countries impacted by climate change? And um, in your opinion, Eva, what are some of the main areas global North countries need to think differently to reaching out to communities at risk in terms of um, financing uh, locally led adaptation initiatives and ensuring that uh, we have communities at the center. So how does uh, your government and uh, how could other global North governments allocate climate budgets for the countries impacted by climate change? Eva, over to you. Thank you, and, and thank you very much uh, for this introduction. And it was very interesting to, to listen to the previous presenters. Uh, like, you, like you said, my, my um, focus mostly uh, in my work is on the UNFCCC negotiation process uh, and on the sort of international uh, climate finance uh, discussions. So I think from that perspective, I could say a few words and then give the floor to my colleague, Peter Copper, who is here, who is um, very knowledge knowledgeable on the more on locally led adaptation and the initiatives that we take as the Netherlands. So, and also because I think we're running out of time, I will be sure just we've been discussing here a lot about um, adaptation finance, um, and, and access to adaptation finance. I think one of the other uh, discussions that is um, held within Union of Triple C is um, uh, more about the quantity of finance. Um, and as you probably all know, in the negotiations in, um, in Glasgow last year, uh, we agreed uh, collect that we would collectively double our adaptation finance um, from 2019 to 2025. So I think looking ahead of COP, 27, uh, this doubling commitment um, that we made will be one of the um, one of the topics that will be central stage on um, on the agenda. Um, and what I would also like to mention here is um, related to the the interventions that were made that uh, within the UNFCCC process uh, there are quite a few initiatives that focus on um, improving. Um, the access um, to adaptation finance or climate finance in general. And I would just like to mention them here briefly because it may be interesting for those in the poll to, to see in what form they can link to these initiatives. And one of them is um, the task force on access to climate finance. That was a task force linked by the UK COP26 presidency uh, and really uh, is trying to see um, through dedicated country partnerships, how the international community can sort of more coherently and effectively support developing countries um, in their effort to adapt uh, to climate change. So that's one. And, and another one that you uh, perhaps uh, known about is the, um, the initiative uh, of um, the UN, United Nations Secretary General the Adaptation Acceleration um, Program. Uh, sorry, the Adaptation Pipeline Accelerator, I'm sorry. That's also an initiative that really aims to improve collaboration for adaptation finance uh, and develop adaptation pipelines in individual countries. Um, and perhaps uh, another initiative, and I think that's also where the Netherlands uh, is very active on, is um, 
we've launched, uh, it's called Champions Group on Adaptation Finance. Um, that's a group of uh, 14, um, 14 um, well, 12 countries and two um, European Commission and the um, African Development Bank. And what we also try to do within the UNFC, UNFCCC process is to really, um, well, champion adaptation finance, both the, to increase the, the quantity of finance, so related to the doubling, the quality, and also the, um, the um, aspects of uh, access to climate finance. So that's to say that how adaptation finance um, is also discussed within the international framework. And then maybe one word on, on what the Netherlands is doing. Um, what we always want to do on adaptation uh, finance is to sort of also lead by example in a way, and that means that we are scaling up our uh, finance for adaptation uh, quite significantly um, over the next couple of years. Um, what we all also do is that um, almost all of our public climate finance is um, in the form of grants. Um, and uh, over half of our climate finance uh, total is spent on adaptation. Um, and I think with that, we also um, engage in discuss discussions with other donor um, countries to see how they can also gradually, um, yeah, uh, perhaps see if they can spend a greater percentage uh, in the form of uh, grants and um, spend more of climate finance on adaptation in general. Um, well, I think I can say a lot more on the specific activities that we do, uh, but. Um, I think for now, I, I leave it here and give it um, uh, to my colleague, Peter, who's also on the call. Thank you. Um, thank you, Eva, uh, on sharing your experiences from the UNFCCC um, a, a point. And uh, yeah, we saw from the last COP that the, there was that commitment to, that, to double adaptation finance um, for the next five years. Um, I think when we're doing the round of uh, answers, we'd like to hear from you. Where is the progress in terms of this? Uh, if you have any information on, apart from Netherlands on how other uh, countries are doing on that. And, and Peter, in two minutes, could you please share with us um, the government of Netherlands um, initiatives towards uh, financing locally led adaptation initiatives? Thank you. Two minutes is definitely uh, too short for that, but uh, what, what I can say and to answer your question, uh, and hello everyone, by the way, great, great to see familiar faces and new ones here too, to answer the question in terms of what, what is needed from the global north versus uh, the south, even though I don't like that divide too much, to be honest, but I think, you know, from, from development partners perspective, I think, uh, um, I think we, we can do more. Uh, to make sure that the local level is reached. We know that the financing isn't, isn't coming to that level that uh, oftentimes climate finance is, is left. So I think, you know, as, as the Netherlands, we do a lot of multilateral uh, climate finance, but we particularly also try to look at, at national, subnational levels. And so we have programs at that level uh, to, to, to make sure that we, we, we reach the, the, the communities and the people that are on the front line and that we always speak about and that are never actually mentioned. So there's a couple of things we do. We do that. We're looking at our flexibility. So how can we be more flexible? Because locally led is, you know, if you will, bottom up, even though uh, that, that might not be a, a, the, the right wording as well, but making sure that the communities that we're trying to reach are actually uh, uh, are actually engaged in decision making as well. Uh, that requires flexibility because we don't know, uh, you know, on the offset where the funding is needed, what the demands are, but we want it to be demand driven. So we are looking at opportunities and ways to collaborate uh, uh, with, with, those, with those specific uh, needs. We're looking obviously at financing mechanisms because it, I mean, it sounds really great. Nobody is against this, but there's all sorts of bureaucratic processes when you work for large organizations to make sure that you have the instruments and procedures in place that you can actually reach the, 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 the level that, that is needed. And so I think that's, that's super important. And we work with a, a wide area of, of partners and we have that conversation. And, and quite frankly, we don't pride, pride ourselves as, as the locally led 
uh, adaptation champion. But we do find it important. And as I ever mentioned, we try to lead by example. So what we do do is um, uh, take this serious. We've endorsed the principles of the locally led adaptation principles last year, and we're trying to put them in, in place. And quite frankly, it's a learning process. And, and we are keen to learn how others are doing that and, and, and what struggles there are, but we're serious about it. And so we're also trying to advocate for that local level. So for instance, at COP also, um, you know, amplifying the voices of local communities and not just us speaking, but also having them speak. Uh, so I think those are just a couple of examples, I think, in terms of what we're doing and, and perhaps uh, uh, how we can collectively uh, move this ag agenda forward. Thank you so much uh, for keeping to the two minutes, uh, Peter, and uh, sharing some of the initiatives that the government of Netherlands is doing. Uh, in terms of uh, ensuring that there's flexible funding because it needs to target the needs of the people um, where the money is, is channeled in terms of addressing the needs of climate change. And now we have, I think about less than um, 15 minutes. I would like to request the panelists. I am sure you've all seen uh, all set of questions that have been directed to you. Um, I would like to request you each, uh, we are six panelists here to take at least a minute to really try and summarize uh, some of the responses to the questions that we have on, on the chat. And uh, while doing that, um, also share with us some of the um, practical examples on how uh, gender would be I think Marlene got disconnected for now. I will try to pin all the speakers. And for all questions, please direct them to the chat or you can also raise your virtual hand. Okay. Should I go ahead? Uh, yeah, please. Okay, thank you. So let me be very brief. So I think uh, the experiences of Nepal is really valuable and we can use the learning hubs, regional sharing, including knowledge products in terms of uh, making sure that uh, we have, uh, you know, we scale up this finance uh, modality, the experience of Nepal to other countries. So if you look into the funding, you know, dynamics, uh, larger, you know, of these, you know, financial resources available for locally led adaptation, it comes from the inter international bilateral donors and less than 10% is you know, directly uh, funded by the government of Nepal. So still uh, the dependency is on the international financing to support locally led adaptation. Uh, and slowly the local governments are you know, allocating budget to support the local climate action. So that is happening and it is quite encouraging to see uh, the local governments taking that lead. There are some, uh, you know, contestation in terms of prioritization. Often the local uh, leaders who are elected, uh, they have, uh, you know, priority to do, uh, look into immediate uh, actions that will benefit uh, their vote bank, vote, voters. But uh, one way to influence them that we have tried in Nepal is to really influence them and integrate in their election manifesto in their party's manifesto so that uh, the political leaders are are able to mainstream climate environment issues within uh, their political you know priorities that is happening slowly it's not that encouraging but the but we have been trying to intervene in that way so there are so many you know different ways through which uh, the learning piloting the experience of local communities the value of local knowledge Yet uh, the need for, you know, getting support uh, in terms of technology transfer at the local community is very important to deal with these, you know, uncertain and very complex uh, climate-induced uh, risks, which are beyond, you know, the capacity of local communities, local government, and even national government to respond to some uh, context. 
So I think those are some of the questions that has been raised. I'll stop there because of the time. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, Bimbal. Oh, okay, Marlene, you are here. Please continue. Yeah, let's proceed to the next speaker, please. Matilda. Yeah, thank you. So if I may, I, I will take the question about how gender could be integrated uh, in financially locally led actions for transformative results, as I got some very specific questions in the chat and uh, not public questions. <laughs> so I will take the one on gender. So very quickly from our perspective, um, actually, I think it has been said already, but everything starts with needs identification and problems identification. So we work with local financial institutions, uh, which develop specific projects for, us, for specific vulnerable groups groups um, and these uh, financing institutions support the economic activities managed by these groups and we know that men and women are not involved in the same kind of economic activities uh, depending on the context so we had a very very quick example with insurance products we supported an insurance broker which offered an insurance product for Mali for maize producers in Mali and they realized after a while that mostly men were involved in such production and uh, they wanted to target women. So finally, they developed another specific product for another crop uh, where women were more involved. So actually, if they had started with identifying where women are involved in terms of economic activities, what types of specific risks they are facing, they could have developed a specific financial products for women from the very beginning. So we think that uh, it's very important to include a gender perspective from the needs identification and uh, into the uh, identification of adaptation solutions as well. And then to support specific solutions uh, dedicated to specific risks faced by women and uh, for time reasons i will also stop here but i'm happy to pursue the conversation uh, later thank you eva uh, julius uh, yeah thank you yeah thank you so i i was going through the chat and i what i noted was that i think there were some agreements to to some of the points, especially on the issue of the, the special uh, window for, uh, uh, that can be opened to support uh, local CSOs and other local stakeholders directly. And I think there was a, uh, some debate about where, whether the small grants um, uh, program is, is really a, a, a good program that can support uh, local aid adaptation, but uh, maybe we can learn from that. Um, we we are looking at the uh, uh, here. We are looking at local aid adaptation uh, in, uh, interventions at local um, uh, in different um, uh, uh, you know uh, districts and and the subnational uh, governments. So it's the the what has been coming out very clearly has been the. The lack of um, capacities, for example, for for local stakeholders to implement, uh, to conceptualize, conceptualize, but also implement uh, different projects and programs um, uh, from financing that is coming from uh, international sources, and that um, already is, a, is something that needs to be addressed um, uh, uh, first of all before we even go deep into implementation of some of the uh, bigger programs with the, the local stakeholders. So the like the Jeff Small Grants uh, program that has been implemented so far in different countries, I think has multiple uh, kind of lessons. Uh, some some have, have, have actually benefited as local stakeholders in terms of uh, building their capacity as they are also implementing some of these programs. So why not take the the, the positive lessons out of that, uh, improve on that program, and then see if it can also work for. For some of our other, uh, you know, uh, funding mechanisms like the GCF, so that uh, at least we are now dealing with the uh, local capacities first, and then see if we going in the long term we can be improving the program to address certain challenges. Uh, otherwise, uh, those are some of the things that I wanted to to also comment on. Thank you. Thank you so much, Julius. Uh, Willie. Uh, your reflections on the questions and how Vanuatu would actually improve its experience on 
ensuring that gender is integrated in climate finance to support uh, transformative action. <clears throat> Yeah, th thank you very much. Um, I, I think uh, one of our colleagues uh, already mentioned about it. Um, the, the, one of the truth is that when we're looking at how women are engaging in all the different projects, um, and this is also what we see at the grassroots level as well, that uh, a more sustainable uh, projects and a more effective uh, projects are always led by women at a local level. And this is one of the things that is a truth that uh, I see across uh, Vanuatu and even within the Pacific region uh, on, on different projects that are sustained over time. Maybe women are um, uh, uh, in the Pacific, <coughs> according to the culture, they are the one that's spending more time in, in, uh, at home and looking after uh, kids and so on. And I think from that perspective, really give them this opportunity to 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 be sort of a, a very manageable people at the very grassroots and to make things more sustainable and more, more stronger. And I think uh, when we're looking at developing all those uh, climate financing, one of the things that I see is the lack is that how we send that we we send that those finance around women where there are mainly uh, um, uh, uh, people that are really sustained uh, projects for a long term. And uh, this is one of the things that uh, personally I, I I think that when we when we're looking on, on that uh, we, we have to have that lens of having women engaging in different level of uh, climate uh, finance and access to those uh, climate financing. So um, <clears throat> this is one of the things that uh, um, uh, I see from from that perspective, and um, also making sure that integrating that in all the different planning, whether it comes from whether it's uh, mitigation or adaptation. Uh, uh, climate uh, finance uh, plannings, integrating that within that, uh, it will be really help and really uh, looking at the long term sustainability of all the different uh, actions on adaptations at the very uh, local level. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you so much, Willie, uh, for that. And um, uh, please, I want to allocate Eva and Peter uh, one minute each. Uh, please uh, share with us. Um, some of the feedback that you've seen on the chat on uh, uh, how uh, developed countries would actually improve uh, financing uh, locally led initiatives at the local level and ensuring that even the, the, the climate finance, especially I would give an example of let's say green climate fund that ensures that um, the principles for locally led adaptation are enshrined in these projects. Uh, in one of the projects that uh, care is running uh, across the 10 countries, we are seeing that um, uh, the principles are not well integrated in the, for example, uh, some of the finance mechanism projects. But before we get to that, which is related to key messages to COP27, uh, please share with us uh, how do we ensure that gender is taken care of um, from the global, not a development perspective, but also how do we ensure that we don't leave out anyone at the local level in this year? Peter. Yeah, thanks. A lot of question. I think much too too much for, for one minute. Uh, just one point on the question that you also asked on, on, on the progress towards the doubling. I think you asked before how we're going to showcase or, or measure progress on the doubling. I think for this COP, it's the first COP after COP, uh, COP26 that we announced uh, or that we committed to the doubling that we uh, will try to show as, um, I think, all the international communities, how we in general are going to increase our finance for adaptation. Uh, as developed countries, we will do that amongst others through an update uh, of the progress report on the climate finance delivery plan. And I think um, on the margins of the um, COP27, we'll discuss with uh, amongst ourselves and with, with, with developing country partners on how we could best um, uh, make progress on this doubling commitment, uh, because it will be a challenge and everybody uh, is aware uh, of that, uh, also considering the lessons learned from, from reaching the 100 billion goal of climate finance in general. One point on gender is that we try in, um, in uh, at least in the climate finance negotiations to bring in the gender aspect um, uh, in all of our negotiations. Uh, it was, um, and also refer back to the gender action plan that we adopted um, at COP25. Um, so, um, yeah, from a negotiation perspective, we will try what we can to, to bring in the gender lens to all the discussions we have. Um, I'm very keen uh, um, 
to, lead, to, to read the answers to the, your last questions on the Mentimeter on what we can take forward to COP27. And, and I'll see what I, in my capacity as climate finance negotiator and as part of the EU team, can do to bring these um, messages uh, forward. Uh, but perhaps Peter on, um, on uh, locally led adaptation. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, maybe Peter, one minute. <laughs> sure, one minute. <laughs> um, no, maybe, maybe just uh, slight one thing to add, and I mentioned it last time. I think, and I saw a lot of the discussions in terms of accreditation to the GCF and organizations like that. I know that it's it's a super, um, you know. Uh, sticky process. It's very slow. So I, I would think, you know, the best way to move this agenda forward or the best way, one way to move this agenda forward would be to, to do as, as again, as de developing uh, development partners to work both at the multilateral level. So through the bigger funds, because that's how we channel large sums of money, but to, at, at the same time, working directly also with, you know, um, communities and groups at the local level, whether this is city, I mean, and again, local, we haven't defined, we didn't have a dis discussion on what actually is locally led and what is local and et cetera. But I think uh, finding opportunities to work directly more at the, at the level that is is underrepresented here, and I think for ever uh, for every uh, partner that's that that there are different actors, there are different opportunities. But as the Netherlands, we try to find that entry p uh, point, whether it's it's Beira in Mozambique at the city level, or whether it's smallholder farmers, or whether there are other uh, uh, local stakeholders where we directly through our programming uh, um, try to uh, tr try to reach them. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um... Peter, thank you so much, all our, our super panelists. I think uh, uh, next time we'll have more time allocated to issues to do, especially with climate finance, because it's at the heart of everyone. But before we close, I would like to hear your key messages to COP27 on uh, financing locally led adaptation initiatives. We know uh, COP27, one of the key issues would be to look into um, the global goal on adaptation progress and uh, how is that? Uh, uh, unpacked, and, and, and therefore, what are the key messages to COP27 for financing locally led adaptation initiatives? Uh, your thoughts here um, would be uh, very much uh, appreciated. I will quickly read through the comments, and afterwards, I will hand over to Palash to close the session also in one minute, just to keep time for the other session. So, first, I can see some comments coming in here like, um, there is need for inclusive finance and ever since you're here as the uh, lead climate negotiator for Netherlands and hoping that you will be able to get this message to the negotiation room and also represent all, all of us who are in this session today. Uh, we need a dedicated, flexible and sustained financing for locally led adaptation. Local adaptive solutions and impact measurements is very key. Where are the key research gaps and how can funders design funding calls to address this particularly to ensure empowerment of local actors? Uh, we also have another additional uh, message here. Finance institutions, particularly the Adaptation Fund and the Green Climate Fund should be explore, exploring how they can be more accessible to local institution in delivering adaptation. And we've seen there's been a lot of uh, barriers, especially for local organizations to access um, the, the, the GCF resources, but also the AF. Uh, more comments are coming in, uh, but in the interest of time, I would like to welcome Palash uh, to, to close our session. And um, I would like to say thank you so much uh, for the great uh, comments and feedback from the participants and the panelists. Um, it was my pleasure uh, facilitating this session and over to you, Palash. Thank you, Merlin. Uh, we are really at the end of the session. So time to say thank you. Uh, firstly, I would like to start by thanking you all, uh, the speakers for their uh, excellent thought-provoking talks, uh, the session moderator for organizing and uh, animating the session and keeping things under control and reasonably on time. Uh, I like to note my sincere gratitude to uh, IAED colleagues for excellent guidance and support. Uh, most importantly, I would like to uh, thank you all, uh, the participants. Uh, without your input, ideas, and uh, discussions, uh, these sessions would not uh, have been the success as it has. Finally, I like to thank uh, Sisonek and uh, Adia Luxembourg for uh, joining here as co-host for the session. Uh, it's been a uh, pleasure 
being with uh, all of you today. Uh, I wish you all the best. Uh, with this, we conclude here. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you all. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye. bye.